in the meantime, just to make the announcement that those people who haven't been enlightened yet, uh, you might as well stay up all night, waste the time going to bed, this is your last chance. For those who are already enlightened, you can have a nice rest this evening. <laughs> now, nah, have a nice rest. So here we go, we do the chanting. So what do we do to start the chanting? <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> you notice that when you cough and people laugh, people don't tend to get sick? But it's fun. So here we go. <coughs> wait, wait for it. The first thing about our meditation is learning how to be patient. So just wait for things to happen. Alright? <laughs> Yadi Gangsha Thai Puri 
สายุกานิฮะทะปุริสัพุกะลาเอสะภะกะวะโทสะวะกะสังโกอาหุเนยโยอาหุเนยโยตาคิเนยโยอันเชลิคารานิโยอานุสาวัณปุญญาเอทังโลกาสาธิทังห้ามดูห้ามเมตุสุตาย e นอังกฤษยีวิคัมยีสิสวัสดิ์ทีรันปายวันหัวสิลิงกุณัสแอนกุณัสอาภัฟกีส Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, not busy with duties and frugal in their ways. Peaceful and calm, and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety. May all beings be happy, whatever living beings they may be, whether they are weak or strong, or meeting none. The great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen. Those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be happy. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will. Wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart, should one cherish a living being, radiating kindness. Over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, upwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down. Free from drowsiness, one should sustain its recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding, final holding to false views. The pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision. Being free from all sex desires is not born again into this world. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> okay, so we have heaps of questions to get through tonight. So sit comfortably, and we will begin with the question number one: Is a complicated n i r t a good or bad? Good, bad? Who knows? Who knows? This is a n i r t a isn't it? So it's good, no matter what you're doing. 
I'd always tell you it's not just good, it's very good. Even if you spend the last eight or nine, how many days we've been here? I forget. The last seven or eight days sleeping all the time. Very good. So it's not your fault. There's no one in here, as I said this morning, there's no will, there's no being in there, so who's to blame? Anatta. No responsibility. Yeah. That's why I say that any complaints, go and see Eng Ching or Angie or Shirley, any compliments, come and see me. <laughs> I don't take any responsibility. So it's still very good. Complicated images are still very good. Complicated images is when you see scenery, faces, stuff like that. So there's not more than one thing going on there. That's complicated. So try and keep it simple. And I, I, somebody did ask me that question in the interview time. What you do to turn a complicated limiter into a simple one is look for the most beautiful part of that limiter. I remember once seeing the scenery with the lakes and trees, and there was one tree which had one dewdrop on its uh, tip, on, on the tip of one of the leaves. It sparkled. And so I immediately focused on the sparkle, and the sparkle became a beautiful limiter. Or if it's seeing some jewelry, Look at this wonderful diamond, or it may be just a glass diamond. Somebody might have a glass eye, just look at the glass eye, see it sparkle. And then that sparkle turns into something beautiful. So you just focus on the most beautiful part. And the most beautiful part is you turn it into a really nice limiter, if you've got a complicated limiter. Dear your emptiness, please convey our thanks to Angie, Enching, Shirley, and all those who made this retreat such a memorable one. What do you mean memorable? Just let it go. <laughs> So a round of three sadhus for Angie, Enchim and Shirley. Sadhu! 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 Very good. Now forget it. <laughs> Next question. Thank you. That's deep. <laughs> Who are you saying thanks to? Is it me? What is this me you're saying thank you to? Is it my my belly? <laughs> so because I do the sign of compassion because when I come up here, that all those other people are overweight. You don't feel so bad? <laughs> when your teacher is overweight too? <laughs> so it's really hard staying slim. It's really hard. You can't eat what you want. You have to exercise. You can't do this. You can't do that. It's out of compassion for you. So it's, if it's all right for us, it must be all right for me. Very good. It's a statue of you. Statue, yes. My teacher, Ajahn Chah, he was fat. And the great, you know, the, the happy Buddha is always fat. <laughs> So I'll just keep your tradition. <laughs> Dear Antonis Ajahn Brahm, thank you so much for sacrificing your peaceful time to teach us for so many days. You have such a big sacrifice. Oh, you don't know how much I had to sacrifice to you guys. It was really tough. I really need a lot of sympathy. Am I going to get any? No. <laughs> no, it was a pleasure. May you never be reborn. That means I can't come back and teach again. <laughs> Who's going to take over? You can. Okay, very good. It's a nice thing. You might never be reborn. I don't know which, what, the, which way to take that. Are you trying to get rid of me? <laughs> 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 anyway. uh, you spoke about being a visitor this morning. How do you become a visitor? I am not in control of the instance of marriage and relationships. And how does one use meditation to achieve this? It's easy. Next time you meet your wife, Imagine her as your mistress. <laughs> and then you'll love her much more passionately. <laughs> and next time you see your, you know, your husband who's over 60, imagine that he was toy boy. <laughs> and then you'll be so nice to him. So it's not my husband, he's my toy boy. He's not my wife, she's my little mistress. And then you, know, you play around like that, how much <laughs> Does that work? I know I'm innovative, I'm getting into big trouble here, but nevertheless. Uh, in marriage relationship, how does one use meditation to achieve this? Yeah, the one thing in a marriage or a relationship, don't own your partner. I don't know how many times that, uh, you know, especially young people, they come up and they feel smothered by their boyfriend or by their girlfriend. You know, the girlfriend or the boyfriend is so afraid the relationship might fall apart they sometimes they tend to worry so much, they control, they always want to be with you, they never give you any free time, because, you know, they're smothered, you know what it feels like. And that's because of fear. 
fear and control always go together. So when well, I'm not afraid of what you do, I let you do whatever you want. I'm not afraid that you won't meditate, you come here all this way, of course you'll meditate, you're all highly motivated, you do as much meditation as you possibly can. But go for it, I don't need to control you. The same if you're afraid that your partner may be cheating on the side, that fear will make you try and control them. And when you try and control them, they get so upset at you, then they will get somebody on the side, because they're unhappy with you. So remember, trust in the relationships means you, you, know, you can let each other be and trust in your meditation, to let go, no fear, and then you don't control meditation, just flow very smoothly. So that's like being a visitor, you just trust and you don't control. And then it goes really, really well. The other thing is, when you're a visitor, you know it's not going to last forever. Relationships don't last forever. Either you get divorced or end up in a box. <laughs> in a <crematorium. laughs> it's true, though, you can't argue with that. It doesn't have to last forever, so even a relationship is a temporary one. You have to be married for 40, 50, 60 years. It's all temporary. So when it's really temporary, you know the relationship's not going to last forever. That means you take better care of it. You're only a visitor. And oh, well, lovely Sibili, a young child will pick up the grass, he say, can you see the crack in this grass? Can you see the crack in this grass? Come here, he said, there is one there, but it's microscopic. And one day, Someone will drop this grass, or they'll kick it as they get up to do some bowing or whatever, and this grass will break. The invisible crack will get wider, and this will be destroyed. He said, because there's a crack in this, it's called impermanence. It's called fragile. That's why I have to care for this grass. But as this grass was made out of plastic, in other words, unbreakable, it had no cracks in it at all. I could kick it, throw it, I wouldn't need to care for it because it would last forever. But because it's fragile, that's why we have to care. If you think your relationship's going to be there forever, like plastic, you don't need to care for it. When you realize that one day, either you know the relationship is going to just fall apart or one of you is going to die, when you know it's fragile, that means you care. When you know you're only a visitor with this person, you know the day is not going to be forever. That's why every one of them is important. That's why you care. So in a relationship, remember, it's not going to be forever. And the happy day you have today, it goes very quickly. So please enjoy the moment with your partner, with your lover, with your friend. It goes too quick. So you care for every moment. That's how we act as a visitor. Dear Ajahn Brahm, can the deaf, blind or mute gain wisdom? Which one are you? <laughs> or three? They don't seem to have the cause to precipitate wisdom. Your wisdom on this matter, thank you. The trouble is if they're mute, deaf and blind, they can't tell you how wise they are. Who knows, those deaf people, they may be so wise, they just can't teach you. So at least, when they're deaf, if they're mute, at least they can't break the fourth precept. That's one good thing. <laughs> now if they're deaf, blind or mute, a lot of times people have got one disability, but it's very rare having all three. Maybe deaf and mute, but if a person is, this is interesting, just an aside here, if they are deaf and they're blind and they're mute, they actually usually die. And the reason is because they can't really express themselves in the world. The body is here for our five senses. The body is here for our senses to explore and play and find pleasure in the world. The body is a vehicle. The five senses aren't here for the body. The body is here for the five senses. So if the five senses aren't working, you die. There's no reason to sustain the body. It's one of the four conditions for the maintenance and support of the body. Contact, which means sensory experience. So the deaf, the blind, don't have that sensory experience. So straight away, their engagement in this thing we call life is diminished. However, if someone is just blind, or someone is just deaf, or someone just, well actually those are the main ones, if they haven't got any sense of smell, that's not a big one. 
body, sense of taste, that's not a big one either. But especially blind and deaf, they're very, very important. If you've just got one of those gods, I've only got four senses rather than the five, you know what happens, one of the other senses becomes more acute. In other words, that part of the brain usually sort of taken up with hearing is now sort of free to go into seeing. So you can actually see more deeper or you can actually feel more deeper. So people who have got some disability in one of those senses usually compensate in another sense. And I always remember this. This was one of the stories about wisdom and compassion, which I read in an article, and I think I put in the opening of the door of your heart as one of the stories. There was a young boy born deaf, really deaf. And uh, he was taken, obviously, to the doctor for regular checkups, and one just regular, ordinary checkup. <coughs> the doctor told the parents that he just read in a medical journal a new procedure had been developed, and they found about 10% of kids you know, with this hearing disability were cured with this simple procedure. And the doctor said, well, it's very simple, it's not really painful, but you know, maybe general anaesthetic, that's all. Do you want to try that out for your kid? So it's only a 10% chance of success, but they said, well, why not? Who knows, and it might work for our kid. And so they gave the operation for that kid, and he was one of those 10%. After the operation, he could hear again. And that kid was so angry and upset. He said to his parents, why didn't you ask me, first of all, whether I wanted to hear? He said, this is such an awful noise. I was much happier not having that sense disturbing me. And he actually said in this interview, if you wanted to help me, give me another hand. Because that's how he was experiencing the world, through his sense of touch, even much more than his sense of sight. He's incredibly sensitive in his sense of touch. He said, I didn't want to hear. And you assumed the hearing was good. <coughs> when I heard that, I realized that sometimes you really think you're helping somebody, and you're not. And of course, he never heard that conversation because he was deaf. If he'd have heard it, he would say, no, 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 leave me alone, I'm quite happy as I am. So sometimes, we want to change people. We want to change them, we think it's better to be like us. And actually, they're more happy as they were. So ask them first of all. So, deaf, blind, usually I think you probably pass away if you're both. But if you're one, and not the other. Usually the other senses become very acute, compensate, and usually get very wise. Dear Ajahn, when a human dies, they will rebirth or become ghosts. Can a ghost die? If yes, what do they become? That's interesting, isn't it? What happens to ghosts? If they die, you know, do they actually die slowly? And they have ghost doctors who try to revive them, who give them, the, uh, C not CPR, CGR. You know. <laughs> So I'm trying to think that Jeeva ghost, trying to revive them. Do they have hospitals for ghosts, do you think? I often wonder that about ghosts. I mean, what if, do actually ghosts fall in love and get married? Now the girl ghost and boy ghosts, and you know, sometimes one of the boy ghosts passes by and say, wow, that female ghost, she's really hot. <laughs> and they go out together at ghost nightclubs and stuff. And what do they eat? And, uh, <laughs> and what do they, because apparently they only come out at night time, so where do they go during the day? It's really weird, isn't it? Because they usually only come out in the daytime. Do they go into their graves at night uh, during the daytime? They've got to get up there, back into the cemetery before it's uh, dawn, so they can go and sleep again. Where do they go at night? Or during the daytime, I wonder. There's lots of interesting questions you can ask ghosts. And are there such things as ghost dogs and cats as well? <laughs> well, can there be? Because sometimes the dogs die, what happens to them? Can they get reborn as ghosts? And if there are ghosts, are there ghost dogs? People ask that question. When you go to heaven, can you take your cat and dog with you? Because people really love their cats and dogs. So, you know, it'd be a lot of suffering if you can't share the happiness of heaven with your dog or your cat. And apparently, according to the Christian tradition, you can't. Because <laughs> I heard about this, and I think I was one of the monks in Melbourne just last May in which you were talking about this. You know that there was a crazy American pastor who said, first of all, the world was going to end in April. When it didn't, he postponed it to October last year. You remember that? And there was one really sharp guy in the United States. Now, if I had a hat, I'd take my hat off to this guy. 
he started a company. Because according to that Christian tradition, this is now the evangelical Christian tradition, not the good Christians, but you know, the crazy ones. <laughs> and you know, some of them are really good, you know, just like some of those. But anyway, they believe that sometime in October last year, they would have the rapture, which means all the believers suddenly sort of, they would disappear and all their clothes would be on the ground. Because they would be taken up naked into, into heaven. But they could take their cats and dogs with them. And this enterprising man said, look, I am an atheist, you can look on my blog, my website, I'm a confirmed atheist, you know I'm not going to go to heaven. And you know that your dogs and cats, the ones you really love, they won't go up there. So who's going to feed them when you go? I will feed them for $1,000 per cat or per dog. And I've got a whole group of other, group of other atheists. You know, this is, they can uh, prove that they are atheists. So you Christians know for sure they're not going to go to heaven. And we look, for your, look after your cats and dogs for you. But because you know, many of these people, they're a bit sort of silly, but they're very kind. And so they wonder what would happen to their, you know, their pet dog, a little rover, a little sort of tiddles, a cat, you know, when sort of, you know, we pass away. So they signed up for this. Of course, there's no money back if the rapture didn't happen because these people were totally convinced the end of the world would be last October. So this guy made a killing on it. He, he made millions on this, of these stupid people all signed up. <laughs> For them to look after their cats or dogs. I really was disappointed that the Buddhist Fellowship never saw that <laughs> and offered to help all of the evangelicals uh, in Singapore because they know in their rapture the Buddhist Fellowship, you Buddhists have no chance of going up to heaven so you can stay in Singapore to look after people's pets and dogs. Good idea, eh? For a $1,000 sing a, 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 a cat or dog? Well, there's another end of the world going here, but I think people have seen that, so they won't do it again. He's the first guy who got the idea, good on him, made a fortune. So when a human dies, they'll be reborn or become a ghost, yes. Can a ghost die? Of course a ghost can die. He just passes away and passes on to a new realm. So that's why if you see a ghost, and you really have lots of method, just say, come on, I'll give you some good karma. Remember your good karma as well, ghost. And let go of the ghost realm. And get a nice human realm way in the head of that. You can do that with a bit of help. Now, I, I'm a monk, I've got connections, I can sort of fix it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what they can become. There's this, my story of the, the dog ghost. This was uh, a story from one of my disciples, very beautiful story. This Australian woman, maybe in her 50s, and I don't know if she'd had a relationship or got divorced or you know, never married or the husband died, but she lived alone. Yeah, she was quite well off and she had a nice dog. And the dog was the companion. You know that many people, they love their dog, they love their cat like a human being and they're so close to them, so much so, that many times you have to give grief counselling to people who have lost their dog or cat. I mean, they really are suffering as if they've lost a son or a daughter. And anyway, she lost her dog. Oh, first of all, just a few days before she lost her dog, she was taking the dog for a walk in the park, uh, through a forested, wooded part of this, uh, this park, and when she got halfway home, she realised she'd lost her fingering. It wasn't very expensive, but it was an heirloom. Someone important had given it to her. And so she immediately retraced her steps, trying to find her lost fingering. But it was in a forest, you can't find it. She tried but looked for an hour or two with her dog, couldn't find it at all. And anyway, a few days later, the dog died in the natural causes. And afterwards, she told me this story. She said, afterwards, I heard my dog barking around the house. Now, it's my dog, I know it's bark. Now, if you live with a dog for so many years, you know your sound of your dog's bark is totally different than any other dog's bark. He said, I heard it many times, and so many times I tried to see it. I could hear it in the room, I opened the door, and there's nothing there. And he said, but one day, I heard the dog barking outside the front door of the house. And I happened to be just on the other side of the door. So I quickly opened it to try and see the dog. There's nothing there. Except, in the middle of the welcome mat, right in the middle, was her ring. The ghost dog had found her figure. Uh oh, there's a ghost to that, you must be speaking to him. What are you doing? Taking a picture of the ghost mark, the quite old. 
Why are you coming first? <laughs> okay, here we go. So that's the ghost dogs. And, and maybe cats as well. So I don't know if there's any other ghost dogs or cats, but that's a beautiful one because the dog found her in for her and brought it back. She'd been in and out of the house a long time, but suddenly, whoop whoop, and on the other side of the house, the other side of the door, was her finger in, she must. The dog found it for her. Weird, but it's quite cute, quite lovely. When do we do more meditation as a beginner? Do we, or when we do more meditation as a beginner, do we have more dreams? This last, last eight days, I've had weird dreams. Dreams of monsters, an unnatural death of friends and family members. Thanks. Really, thanks? <laughs> Don't you like your family members? You do with their death. Then you might inherit something if they all die. No. <laughs> Seriously. Now sometimes what happens is when you meditate your mind gets more energy. So one thing you don't need to sleep so much and if you do sleep maybe a bit light because you're energized. Basically nature you don't need to rest so much. But Sometimes you have weird dreams, maybe it's usually what you go to bed with. You know, if you go to bed with feeling negative or feeling tired or feeling a bit sick, then you may have weird dreams. But if you go to bed and do a little bit of loving kindness before you go to bed, then you don't have weird dreams, you have beautiful dreams. So my advice to you is when you go to bed tonight, you know, you're sleeping in your bed, you lay down, get your hand and stroke your hair and say, Good night, me. Have a wonderful sleep tonight. No monsters, no family deaths. I love you very much. See you in the morning, me. <laughs> give yourself a bit of kindness. You give yourself a bit of kindness in the morning before you go to sleep. You don't have bad dreams. Just like the last thought before you die determines your rebirth, you do your last thoughts before you go to sleep determine the type of dreams you have, if any. So see if you can do that. Or, if that doesn't work, you need a bit of uh, money, just get a lottery ticket, maybe an old one, it doesn't matter, just before you go to sleep, look at the lottery ticket and a number, then close your eyes. Can you think of lottery numbers? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't try that, what are you joking? I want to be careful sometimes because I make my jokes and people take them seriously. <laughs> but that one about stroking your hair, that's good, that works. Dear Raja, when I meditate, the limiters, lights that appeared are usually blocked, just like you see in eclipse. Block lights for what I have. Is there anything wrong with my meditation? No, I just leave it alone. And after a while, from the middle of that sort of, of the dark spot, usually a beautiful, first of all, little pin light would usually come out of that dark spot and it would be grow, grow to a really nice limiter. You're getting <coughs> limiters, the beginning of them, but just carry on, they'll soon develop by themselves. That's no worries, that's just part of the course. Dear Ajahn what do I do when I tend to feel anxious and have irrational fears? Thank you for your kindness and great compassion. Actually, somebody I asked them to ask this question because they asked about anxiety, but I didn't have time in the interviews. So, this was that story of a lady in she was in Adelaide who had such great anxiety that she was bedridden. She was doing a dentistry degree in Adelaide University. She'd been to the GP. She'd been to the psychologist on campus, and they could not help her and she got so bad she couldn't even get out of her bed. She was so terrified. Fortunately, she had a boyfriend who cooked and cleaned for her, but she was not getting any better. They had been in bed for six weeks or so, I forget how much, but roughly that time. And her big advantage, her stroke of good fortune, her uncle was a strong supporter of mine. So the uncle said, go and ring at your So she gave me a call. And she said about, well actually her uncle told me first of all what was wrong with her. She had some incredible powerful anxiety attacks, so bad she was in her bedroom. And still a very young girl. And so I asked her, this is how to get rid of anxiety. I said, when you have a panic attack, when you feel that anxiety, 
where do you feel it in your body? Because every emotion has a corresponding bodily feeling. And she said, I don't know. I said, give me a call in three days when you can tell me. I gave her something to do, taking control over her therapy. It's a psychologically wonderful thing to do. So three days later or four days later, she called me up and said, yeah, whenever I have an anxiety attack, I feel it's just above my breast, you know, just in this chest area. I said, great, what does it feel like? She said, I don't know. I said, give me a call in three days when you can describe it to me. Now I was giving her a test in mindfulness. So she had to be aware of this feeling and be able to know it so well she could describe it to somebody else over the phone. Three or four days later she called again and she gave a very good description of the, the feeling when she had anxiety disorder. Now, and I didn't tell her this, but I made her establish mindfulness of the bodily part of that emotional disorder. I said, right, now what I want you to do is to give it some kindness. I never said that, I told her to take your own hand and massage it. Massage it with as much tenderness and love as you possibly can. If you feel you can't do that, get your boyfriend to do that. That's what boyfriends are there for. <laughs> so then give me a call in three or four days. So she was following the instructions. Three or four days later, she called again and said, did you do that? I said, yes. And what happened when your boyfriend or yourself massaged that area during a panic attack? She said, oh, the feeling in the chest disappeared. You know, because that's what happens when you massage. You relax all the muscles over there so that the feeling in the chest disappeared. And then I said, what happened to your anxiety at that time? And that's when she paused. Those wonderful pauses when you realize people are getting the message. She said, the anxiety disappeared as well. I said, exactly. Now you know how to overcome your anxiety. Don't try and deal with it on an emotional level, because you're, basically you're out of control emotionally. But the emotion of anxiety, it does have a physical counterpart. You know that feeling now, you've been mindful enough of it, now add that kindness by massaging it very softly and you find where the physical counterpart of anxiety is eased, the cause of it, the emotion will also go as well. And so, never needed to phone me again. About a couple of weeks later, she was out of bed, back to university, she got her first, first class with honours at Adelaide University. She's just finished doing this incredibly hard to enter course in some part of dentistry in Sydney, a thousand people applied, only three got in, she was one of them. And a couple of years ago, she married that boyfriend and I did the ceremony for her. A nice romantic sort of ending. Happy ever after. That's <laughs> wonderful. I just, they come and see me every now and again because basically I saved her life. Literally. And that's how it works. If you have anxiety or fear, you go to an interview, you're having to perform an examination, or you know, you're getting married or something and you're really, really scared, where is that manifest in your body? What does it feel like? Massage it. Massage it so much that the whole feeling sort of disappears and then you find the anxiety is gone as well. So if you go to some interview for a new job, that's how you do it. Very simple, highly effective. And every time I teach that to psychologists, they get out of their notebooks and write it all down. Well, they never give me any sort of credit for it or any sort of uh, uh, reward for the patent. <laughs> but I don't care, a lot of people are getting rid of anxiety. Dear Ajahn Brown, thank you for being the soft and cuddly, and may I add, wise mark. Oh, isn't that nice? soft and cuddly and wise, but please don't cuddle me, otherwise <laughs> someone takes a photo and I'm in big trouble. Actually, I don't know if I told you the story, but I got, you have to be very careful as a monk. And this actually happened, it was so lucky that no one had a camera. This is true stories. I was teaching in a prison in the town of Bunbury to the south of Perth, and it was an evening um, session, that's the only time they'd let me in. And the only time I could get down there was the afternoon train. So I had about two or three hours you know, to spare. So, you know, Australia's got these beautiful beaches and they're mostly deserted. So I went down to the beach to meditate for a couple of hours. Really nice meditating. Just meditating there by myself, totally empty beach. 
And you know when you go into deep meditation, you can't hear sounds around you. And so when I open my eyes, finish the meditation, it's so peaceful. I noticed there was someone sitting on my left. <laughs> and someone sitting on my right as well. And these were two 17-year-old, you could only describe them as hot chicks, <laughs> in bikinis. <laughs> you know, one with long blonde hair, I think the other one with long black hair, or whatever. Sitting right next to me. And I looked at them, what do you want? Said, oh, we've been waiting for you, we've been sitting here while we saw you meditating, we want to ask you some questions about Buddhism and about meditation. It was perfectly innocent. What had happened, it was the last day of the university entrance examinations in Western Australia. They called it the TEE over there. Tertiary entrance examinations. And they just finished their last exam that afternoon. And of course the last exam into your bathers, down to the beach, party. And I got a heaps of parties later on, but they saw me and it was really interesting. I've never seen them much, you know, Brown Road sitting so still, so they really genuinely wanted to ask questions. So I answered a few questions. I looked around to make sure there was no cameras at the time. <laughs> Imagine you took a camera, Ajahn Brown, with a beautiful blonde, 17 year old in a bikini on his left hand, and I wrote one in the right hand. I would never ever be able to explain that. Never. <laughs> It was innocent. <laughs> when you get this over those troubles, so I've got to be careful sometimes. Well, that happens, so it's really interesting to write. But anyway. No, no, it's been a long time ago before Facebook. Thank goodness. <laughs> before these mobile phones which can take a photograph of anything. In those days you had to have real cameras, but still it was a very close thing. <laughs> You can imagine how I feel. Ah! <laughs> right, I'm innocent, I didn't do anything. <laughs> anyway, thank you for being the sort of cutting mark, wise mark. By the way, when can we stop being silent? Not that it's repressing me or anything like it. Thank you. When you die. <laughs> Be the silent sage. You know, it really impresses people when you just stand there without saying anything. They think, wow. That's so deep. If they ask you a question, you should say to them, he who knows doesn't say. <laughs> she who says doesn't know. <laughs> wow, that's deep. And that way you can get, get away with anything in life. <laughs> when your boss at work asks you a question, you just say, she who knows doesn't say. She who says doesn't know. <laughs> the boss will say, wow. <laughs> or well, they'll probably sack you. <laughs> now, I don't know, when's the right time? You want to start speaking tomorrow? Or lunch time? Not to me, I don't know. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> Okay, whenever you want to. Thank you for the insightful retreat and being a wonderful mentor who has helped me understand and overcome my doubts, fear and lack of confidence in meditation, even though I have not made much progress. No. <laughs> I will continue to persevere with your words in my mind. Have a safe trip back. Do I have to? <laughs> I refuse to follow orders. No, it's it's not exciting having a safe trip. I have an exciting trip back. You know, life is very boring as a month. Nothing much happens except two ladies in bikinis on either side. <laughs> <laughs> now I will have a safe trip. Dear Ajahn, during meditation when I try to do nothing and relax, the mind seems to be just dark with no brightness. Do we need to brighten it up or just be with it? What you can do, another little trick, if you're doing nothing, being still and peaceful, nothing as much is happening, Put your attention on your face, mindfulness of your face, especially the lower part of your face, and move the corners of your mouth up. Make a smile. If you can't make one, fake one. Because <laughs> as soon as you smile, straight away your, your mind gets happy. Now that's a trick which I developed. Sometimes I was getting onto the breath, you know, the breath was really peaceful, but the delightful breath wasn't happening. 
And all I needed was just a little spark of happiness. And how I did it was just, you know, the breath going to be nice and peaceful, and I stopped looking at the breath, looked at my mouth, and smiled. And straight away the mind became happy. I can't sustain that happiness by smiling a lot. It only works for about a second or two. But that was enough to start seeing the breath as beautiful. And then divide the breath to paradise. So it's really nice to be able to smile to your meditation. Just take one. And that gives the brightness and the joy to the mind. And then it's not dark anymore. It lights up. So it's an easy thing to do. And you know, if you want to actually maintain that smile, see if you can get some tape. And it's going to take the corner out of the bed. I'm going to make it so hard on the same, constantly smiling. Then Ajahn, is it wrong to feel so discouraged? Don't talk about being an hour hat. The mentor also seems to take eons with method. That's what happens when you start talking about the psychic powers and limiters and jhanas and enlightenment to be able to fly through the air and say, I can't even watch my breath. Even I've been looking for the present moment all week and I still haven't found the present moment. And sometimes you feel so discouraged. I'm hopeless. I'm terrible. This actually happened. This is one of the stories I like telling at the end of the retreat. There was a nun, a bhikkhuni, who had been a bhikkhuni for seven years. And throughout those seven years, she hadn't had a moment of peace of mind always restless or fast asleep. She could never meditate. And after seven years, you know, you've only been here for a few days. It is seven years. Imagine how discouraged she would be. She said, I don't want to disrobe. I don't want to go to husbands and, and house life again. But I was wasted time staying as a nun because I can't meditate. There's only one choice. So she got a length of rope. She went into the forest. She climbed a tree. And she tied one end of the rope to a stout branch and the other end of the rope to her neck. And was just about to jump off when her mind became peaceful. And she had her first deep meditation. <laughs> that was cutting things very fine. Well, that's a true story. She told that in her poems of the enlightened nuns in the time of the Buddha. And you ask, why did that happen? It was because she gave up and she let go. That's why she had a deep meditation. So any of you who haven't had a deep meditation, no, don't do that. Otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be trouble. But anyway, if you try, if you can't meditate, there's no way you could do that either. You'd make a mistake again. So, the point of that story, why she told it, was this, she was trying so hard to meditate. And in the end, seven years, trying, 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 getting nowhere. So what's the point? She just came up. She let go. She stopped trying. And that's when you get peace. There's another of my stories I haven't said yet. One of my favourite similes of the donkey and the Julian. When I tell this story in Australia, it's the donkey and the carrot. But in Singapore, you don't really like carrots that much, but Julians, yes, especially this time of the evening. Can you think of a Julian right now? Oh, you're really hungry. Oh, I can smell. I can taste. I can really taste it. I know it's fine. I just close my eyes. And, mm. <laughs> so good torturing you. But anyway, donkeys—they will not follow orders. You hit them with a stick, and they still won't move. But instead of hitting with a stick, you tie the stick to their neck. So the other end of the stick is about two feet in front of their head. On the end of the Thick, you tie a string, and on the end of the string you put a piece of durian. And imagine, the donkey sees a durian. The last durian, because it's 
the donkey comes from Malaysia, comes from Penang. <laughs> and so the donkey moves towards the Julian. But because the donkey moves, the stick moves, the string moves, and so does the Julian move. So it keeps running after the Julian, no matter how fast it runs, the Julian is always two foot in front of the donkey's mouth. Can never catch the Julian, that way he can get the donkey to move and you don't have to waste so many Julians. But, on one occasion, the donkey, the donkey was parked outside a talk when Ajahn Brahm was giving the lecture. And the donkey heard how to catch the Julian. And it's very simple. The donkey runs like hell after that journey. It's been doing that a long time, but the faster it runs, still the journey is going at the same speed. But what the donkey hears on one of these talks is how to stop and let go. He stops chasing the jury. He just stops and stands still. A wonderful word still. What happens to the Julian? Its wings further away. That's what happens when you first let go. You fall asleep, you get restless. You may have meditated before, following the breath. You've never been so restless or sleepy before when you stop and let go. But soon the Julian is four foot in front of the donkey's mouth. It's swinging away. And then it stops. You know what happens next, you're always running ahead of, you, of me, it starts swinging towards the donkey. And soon that Julian is two foot in front of the donkey's mouth where it normally is, but now is coming at great speed towards the donkey's mouth. And all the donkey does not do anything, it just remains still, and just has to remember it's not just stillness, it's also compassion. Just at the right moment, the donkey says, the door of my mouth is open to the Julian. And the Julian gets in, and that's how the donkey catches the Julian. Remember, you've been running, you've all been running long enough. You stop. Julian swings up, down, into your mouth. Thank you very much. That's how you get them to his driver's enlightenment. So it's really easy when you know how to stop. You know how to run. Now you learn how to stop. And he doesn't get discouraged anymore. Once you get the trick, everything happens and it's so easy. And wow! Just as the Buddha said, that's how it happens. Next question coming up, I can open it. Dear Ajahn Brahm, the empty junk eater, can you describe? Oh, dear Ajahn Brahm, the junk eater. <laughs> I don't eat junk. I eat healthy baked beans. Baked beans, I, I read in an article that baked beans, I love those for breakfast. That was way up there in the healthy foods next to broccoli and next door, because it's, no, it's full of um, antioxidants, lots of tomatoes. That's actually very good for you. Can you describe each of the four jhanas in detail and explain the differences? Thank you. Of course I can. That's the answer to that question. Ask can I? <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to, it's in that book for goodness sake. Basically, the difference is the different quality of the bliss. Just like you have different ice creams, they're all ice cream. But there's vanilla ice cream, there's strawberry ice cream, there's chocolate ice cream, and there's double chocolate ice cream. I forget what other ones they have, but anyway, that's enough for now. So they're all ice cream, but they've got a different flavour. And it's the same with the jhanas, they're all bliss, but different flavours of ecstasy. And the more you go deeper, the more subtle and delicious is the ecstasy. Which is, if you ever experience first jhana, you think, wow, this is the ultimate, you can't get more bliss than this. And then when you enter a second jhana, wow, this is so much more delightful than <coughs> the first jhana. It's a totally different type of ecstasy. And when the third jhana, like, wow, this is even more delightful. You never knew there were so many places available. And all more profound, all more deep, 
thousand times better than the one which went before. That's why you really have fun with these jars. And the fourth jar is so still. That is so delightful. Just like a person who's never had fine food before. When you actually get fine food, wow, I never knew something to be so delicious. Those are the giants. Different flavors of bliss. When, do, when we do body awareness, it is simultaneous to doing present moment awareness. It seems impossible to do body awareness and yet still be thinking. Yeah, almost. If you really do body awareness very accurately, you're just aware of a feeling in the body. But a lot of times when a person does have a feeling in the body, then you start thinking about it and giving a commentary about it. But one nice thing with the feelings in the body, there's so many of them, they come one after the other, they don't really give much space to giving a commentary. If you're giving a commentary, you're missing what's happening next. I sometimes remember when I used to listen to fine music. I remember my favourite was uh, this uh, composer Monte Verdi. I don't know why, but I really love that stuff. But anyway, uh, if you're listening to fine music in a concert hall, can you give a running commentary to your partner? Say, oh no, this is a really good part of Bach. This is the place where he does his view, and blah, blah, blah. If you started talking to your partner, what would your partner do, the people sitting around you, if you started talking during a concert? They tell you, shut up, get out. You're not allowed to have a commentary when you listen to fine music. And in fact, if you notice, you don't think why you listen to fine music because the notes, the chords, follow on after each other so quickly it doesn't give you time to think. It fills up all the space in your mind. Now that could be the same with feelings in the body. They can totally fill up your mind, leaving no space for a commentary. Or you do the on mani pad me home, totally filling up the mind. There's no space for thinking or full awareness of the breath. In the very beginning of the in-breath, the end of the in-breath, beginning of the out-breath, the end of the out-breath, totally filling up the mind, so there's no space for anything else. That's what it does. So if you do body awareness really deeply, yeah, I agree with you. But a lot of people, people don't do it to the full extent, and they allow spaces for thoughts to come up. Dear priceless emptiness. That's really good. I like the people who invent new words to start. Your nothingness was very good. Price is emptiness. That's really interesting. Your junk food emptiness, I didn't really like that much. <laughs> <laughs> it might be true. After the morning meditation, after your talks, I do not feel like talking. Silencing of the mouth and feeling tranquil and blissful. Great. Inner joy keeps flowing from heart area. Please come in. Well done. That's what's supposed to happen. After the morning meditation, you're talking, you don't feel like talking. And silence of the mouth and feeling tranquil and blissful. Really, yeah, that's what you're supposed to be feeling. Well done. And in your joy keeps flowing from the heart area. Yeah, carry on. No problems. But you probably wanted to get in the afternoon, never got it. I understand why. Dear Ajahn Brahm is drawing and sketching, breaking the eight precepts. I repeat what you're drawing. If you're drawing pictures of fat monks. <laughs> Then that is breaking the precepts because that's all right. <laughs> no, it's not. As long as you're not sort of, you know, um, doing it too much. Bit of recreation, never mind. Oh, I suppose if you're drawing pictures of people with little balloons and they're speaking, I suppose that's breaking the precepts. I remember, I remember, I remember getting this car, uh, which I actually... Uh, uh, it's like a monk's card. You know, one is for cartoons. I had these two monks in one of these uh, Benedictine or, or Christian monasteries. And one of them, one of those monks, had a little ventriloquist dummy. And he was summoned to the abbot's office and said, No, you can't get out of your vow of silence that way, Brother Timothy, or whatever. <laughs> so you can keep quiet and get a ventriloquist dummy. And so you can talk to people using the ventriloquist dummy, but you're not talking, the dummy's talking. <laughs> so that's not, not a way of doing it. So keep quiet. Can people who get jhana become enlightened when they read sutta or listen to dhamma talk, not during meditation? Yes, that's what happens. Nati jhana nga panya sa panya nati jaya to yami jhana cha panya cha sa we nibana sati ke. Those three seven two dhamma pada. Which means there's no jhana without wisdom, there's no wisdom without jhana, but when there's jhana and wisdom, 
you are in the presence of Nibbana. You're that close. So people ask me, it's a very good comment, people like Devadatta, he had jhanas, but he never became enlightened. He tried to kill the Buddha for goodness sake. So that proves, you get jhanas, you're not always enlightened. True. But if you don't get jhanas, you don't get enlightened. You need the other cause, jhanas and wisdom. Jhanas is like the match. Wisdom is like the gunpowder. When those two come together, boom! And you're enlightened. If you've only got the gunpowder, you've only got all the teachings of the Buddha and wisdom, you don't get enlightened. If you've only got jhanas, but no wisdom, you don't get enlightened. But when those two come together, the jhanas and the wisdom, boom. So you need both. But there's people are just so well uh, learned these days. There's so much information about Buddhism, so much an information overload. The wisdom is easy to come by. The jhanas is the thing which people don't have. They have heaps of gunpowder, but no match. Dear your dear emptiness, this morning's meditation before lunch was mind-blowing, to say the least. Roughly 50 minutes into it, I experienced, I felt an overwhelming feeling of joy. It was like I was inside a tundra storm of rolling black clouds with lightning lightning brights. I felt I was going to burst into laughter. At this point I felt a little scared and wanted you to say take three breaths and come back. I stumbled into a sedated state and something having to sit down in the toilet to get, gather some composure. During lunch I wanted to swim in my soup. Thank you. Yes, great would you want to. Did you, did you have a go swimming in your soup? <laughs> That's what he said. I don't know read that properly. Anyway, sounds good. Great, swimming my soup. So great. I and mean, you had some nice experiences. Brilliant. Enjoy it. Never be afraid though. Just go for it and see if it goes deeper. Forget about your lunch. If you get into a jar, and I should have said this on a crease, so if you get into a jar and you miss your lunch, I will get someone to buy you dinner. So, you know, you can break your break pieces because you, you missed your lunch because you were tired. Dear Ajahn, my spouse had encountered a near-death incident last year and now I'm living in fear that he may die before me whenever he is ill. Is there any way to meditate or any other way to lessen or overcome this fear? Thanks very much. One way over to overcome the fear of your spouse dying before you is to check how much you're going to inherit in the will. <laughs> And then go with it, hey, I'm going to be rich when that guy does. <laughs> oh, forget about it. Just because they had a near-death experience, it's probably had a near-death experience and they're probably told it's not your time to die. So you can ask your, your husband, your spouse, when did they say you're going to die? How many more years have you got left? Did they tell you? And then you actually know where you are. <laughs> so no, don't live with fear in me, die. What fear is you're looking to the future with lots of negativity. Look, he survived one death experience. And he's, you know, he's probably sort of like a cat, has nine lives. So that's only one God. You've got another eight to go before he dies. That's so very easy. It's like that story of the cat who died in my monastery. The cat had nine lives who got hit by a truck with ten wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I say that again? <laughs> the cat had nine lives, but got hit by a truck with ten wheels. <laughs> One, two, three, okay. It's not a good Buddhist joke, especially if you're a vegetarian. I do apologize. <laughs> but it's very funny. Hey, uh, you're most compassionate. I can take that away now. My awakened in light and emptiness, but maybe I'm not so compassionate when I talk, tell a joke about poor cats. My question is, of what precepts, what the precepts and the causal link to meditation? I consciously stick to five precepts in every, stick to the five precepts in everyday life. Not killing living beings, it's, for example mosquitoes, not telling untruths, faithful to my part, no alcohol or intoxicants. Not taking what is not given either. But my meditation is still all over the place and my limiters, if they can be called that, are more like 
a torchlight shining on my eyelids and the moon on a clear night. It was still very good. Are some peeps, presets more cause living to meditation qualities than others? Um, also, I tend to sleepwalk. Once I even woke up in the middle of day right, having sex, no hand taken alcohol or drugs. You woke up in the middle of having sex. <laughs> That <laughs> couldn't have been very good sex. <laughs> I don't say that. 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 Oh, okay, now you're sleepwalking. And I said, that's who was with your partner. And that was someone else. And no, I did take alcohol or drugs. My dreams also tend to be very vi livid and vivid, sometimes illicit. How does one keep one's precepts unconsciously too? I'm okay when I'm awake. Is it because my precepts were broken when I'm subconscious? That my meditation is like milky tea instead of clear water? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> no, it's, you know, when you stick to the five precepts while like you're doing, that's really, really good. You've got nematurs and they haven't grown yet, that's nothing to do with the precepts, just a bit more wisdom, a bit more skill in meditation, and you will get there. As far as sleepwalking is concerned, I don't know too much about sleepwalking, <coughs> but uh, if you want to avoid the problems in sleepwalking, you can condition your mindfulness before you go to sleep at night. You may tell yourself, I will stay in my bed, I will stay in my bed, I will stay in my bed. Basically, you're giving instructions to the mind, so when you get in that state where you usually sleep, well, you stay in your bed. And you won't sort of uh, do things you, you would rather not do. So you can program your mindfulness, give yourself that conditioning, basically, you know, self-hypnosis, self-conditioning, to tell yourself, I will not do these things, I will not do these things, I will not do these things. And that way you find that that affects your dreams, and you don't do those things which cause you problems afterwards. But basically, if there's no intention there, it's no bad karma, it doesn't affect your meditation at all. So basically, you're clear. <coughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, dream retreat is it necessary to be mindful of all activities from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep. With this help, one needs a faster and deeper meditation. It's so hard to be mindful all the time. Exactly. So this is one of the reasons why it's much better to relax more. I know all these people who try to be mindful of every activity, so much stress and so much control, they never get peaceful at all. So I wouldn't try that at all. Let the mindfulness grow naturally. If you go for stillness, the mindfulness gets strong, you get superpower mindfulness, and then your mindfulness suddenly thinks naturally rather than forcing it. But don't force it because it's like, keep it natural. So the mindfulness of all activities comes at its own time. You don't force it, you don't make it happen. Can one get jhana when doing walking, lying down, meditation, walking, no stillness, and lying down, too relaxed to go to sleep? Uh, you can get jhanas when lying down, meditation, but you've got to lie down in the position you don't usually go to sleep in. And jhanas when walking, I never thought that was possible, but someone said it's a monkey in Thailand who could do that, and they know he can do that because he's got all these cuts and bruises on his face because if you get into jhana when you're walking you don't know how to stop so you bump into things so it's not recommended if you're someone who does get jhana while doing walking meditation please buy a crash helmet and other <laughs> stuff which will protect you when you walk over a cliff <laughs> what is the difference between jhanas and nimitas? nimitas come first, jhanas comes afterwards how do we know which stage of jhanas we are in? by reflecting afterwards what it was like and you soon get enough experience of the jhanas you can actually look and see what the Buddha said there's different types of bliss you can actually understand what those different types of bliss are and also it gives you huge amounts of insights Dear Ajahn Brahm there's so many interesting Buddhist articles on the internet these days blogs about this room to show that, um, that Ajahn Zen Tibetan Buddhism, good Buddhist films to watch and I'm guilty of happy spending too much time on these that very often I have no time to meditate. How do I filter what is appropriate material worth spending time on? It's much better spending time on your own mind than actually just seeing other people's minds. It's like Ajahn Chah used to say that when you have your lunch or your dinner, you have the main course first and then you eat the sweets. So all of the reading, seeing the movies, going on the vlogs, that's like the sweets. 
that you can have sweets as long as you have the main core, which is your practice. So you actually keep the precepts and you do the meditation. And then the sweets are like the reading and seeing all these things afterwards. But if all you eat is sweets, you're not going to be very healthy. So you can balance the amount of practice with the amount of study. The study he said with the sweets. The practice, that's the main course. When my breath disappears, I panic and then try to locate my breath. How can I let go? Well, you're going to die anyway, so you might as well get it over and done with. So if your breath disappearing, say, yes, bring it on. I want to die. And then, so you're not panicking anymore. Or you can remember what I keep on saying to you, that it does not matter, your lungs know how to breathe, they've done it for so many years, ask yourself how old you are, if it's been doing it for so long it's going to carry on doing it, you're not going to die now, you haven't got my permission, anyone who's a disciple of mine, before you die you have to ask my permission first of all, otherwise it's very, very disrespectful. I tell people that when I'm on my three month retreat, you know, which is uh, coming up soon, the range retreat, the parts of the ones, I say, during this retreat, you must not die because it's such a, a disturbance for me to come off my retreat and go to your funeral. So out of respect, please don't die for three months, okay? <coughs> and actually, people are pretty good. They usually behave. <laughs> so you haven't got permission to die on this retreat because it will cause so much difficulty and it would disturb, you know, my rest. So, no, please don't do it out of respect for me, okay? Don't be disrespectful. <laughs> so, in other words, that, you know, you don't die. So, if you stop, if you stop breathing, don't panic. Just leave it alone. You mentioned the true meaning of life. It is realized once a meditator achieves jhana states. Please elaborate. That's the simile of the tadpole. The tadpole leaves the water, so he knows the real meaning of water. Dear Madam Sir, you mentioned certain people can do astral travel. What part of the body being travels? Mind, energy, spirit. It is a stream of consciousness that sixth sense creates this mind wave body, which is your vehicle for traveling outside your real body. So your real body is a sixth sense or, or lies there. And your mind made body creates this other body. That mind made body is also the body for ghosts as well. Could you please explain the difference in each jar? I've done that. How does one know if he or she is a stream winner? It's very hard to know if you're a stream winner, but it's certainly easy to know that you're not. <laughs> Next question. For people who get jhana, does enlightenment happen only during jhana state of meditation? Does enlightenment happen during meditation? No, it happens after jhana, it's not during the jhana. The jhana become the cause, and then afterwards, boom! Jaya Brahm, when you visit the higher or lower realms, how do the beings look like? Are they as depicted in the murals, illustrations, the Buddhist monasteries or books? How do you communicate with these beings by thoughts or sign language? When I go into the higher realms, the beings, they all have these uh, uniforms on. Uh, you know, the, uh, the ones which I mostly see in the higher realms have a bit of split skirts, and I think the senior ones are in red, and I think green for the next level, and the normal ones are in blue. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. That's Singapore Airlines, the flight attendants. That's when there's always a couple with caps on in the high realms. <coughs> when, I, <coughs> when I go to the lower realms, they're usually very dirty and they usually have a little hat on with the light on the front. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? The mines in Western Australia, those are the people who inhabit the lower realms, the miners. So that's what the <laughs> the lower realms look like and the higher realms look like. Do I have the higher realms? One last question and we go through the toilet break. The mouth was ah, oh, the meditation. Do I have Can you share your wisdom on when to let things be and when to take action? Someone I know is working in an unethical way. Ooh. Using their position to manipulate and use others for their own personal gain. Ooh. When I see others being hurt and abused, should I take action and speak to the person who's being unethical? If there's something you can do, then do it. But a lot of times there's nothing you can do. So when there's nothing you can do, you just have to let it be and let karma take its course. But soon if someone's doing unethical, they usually get into trouble sooner or later. So if there's something to do, then do it. 
If there's nothing to do, then bide your time. Wait. Also, if you're going to take action, sometimes you have to see, are, are you capable of taking action? How's it going to affect you? Have you got enough strength, enough time? Even our finances, if you're a whistleblower, sometimes you know you get into big trouble like that Julian Assange. So be very careful, know your limitations, know what you're capable of. You know, you know just going back to that, so, that uh, bikuni ordination, before I did that, I really looked, have I got the strength and power to withstand what's going to come? And I said, well, actually, I told some of my friends, I said, I could do this, not many other monks could do this because I've got enough power to do this, I can get away with it. Other people won't be able to do that, they will buckle under pressure. So know your limitations. If you're going to make a stand on some ethical course, sometimes you're not strong enough. You just haven't got the strength. So you just have to let it go. Even though it's painful for others, you can't do anything. It's a very sad thing sometimes to do that, because sometimes you have to know your limitations. But if you can do something, then don't be scared, do it. So that's the last question in the basket. The basket is now empty. So, now's the time to empty your bladders. <laughs> if there's nothing in there, you don't need to go. <laughs> but if there's something to do, then do it. And come back afterwards for some meditation.